This is the Change Fell Podcast with Kevin Brennan and Julian Sammy. Episode 7 on July 5th, 2016. Perverse incentives. Watch, listen, and subscribe at change.fail. No.com on the end, just change.fail. Perverse incentives. It's not just that the incentive isn't giving you the results that you wanted. It's that the incentive is making the thing you wanted to avoid or change go exactly the opposite way that you desired. You pay a bounty for cobras, and instead of getting less cobras, you get more. You pay employees bonuses to get higher sales, and your overall sales go down. So what's so fascinating about this particular perversion for you, Kevin? Well, what's fascinating is how often it actually happens and how many companies get caught up in bad decision making because they make poor assumptions about human nature. And one of the, I think one of the great examples of this is stack ranking employees. This was something that I believe started at GE. Uh, and the idea is that you take all the employees on your team and you rank them from highest performer to lowest performer. And the idea is that the people, a couple of people at the highest end get, will get promotions. Most of the rest of the middle will stay where they are. And the people at the bottom end of it are fired. And you do this every year. Now, the theory is that people are going to work as hard as possible to avoid being in that bottom two. And... You know what? They kind of do, but the behaviors that keep them out of that bottom two are not the behaviors you're looking for, because what you're looking for are every person on your team giving 100% to do their job in day in, day out. But what you get is people realizing that, hey, if I sabotage Bob's performance, if I make it so that Bob screw it appears to screw everything up then bob will be on the bottom and i won't i don't have to run faster than the bear i have to run faster than you exactly and so pe and you know that's what people do they find ways to negatively impact performance of others they engage in all sorts of political games to make sure that they aren't seen as being at the bottom you know they pull down the people at the top because those people are dangerous to them. And it leads to an environment where your people are competing harder against each other than they are against what is supposedly your actual competition. So I think this, this theory of incentivization is probably based on a, an overly simplistic concept of evolution by natural selection. And while it is true that if you take a given population and murder the bottom performing, whatever performance means, if you murder the bottom 5%, the other 95% over time will, you know, optimize their behavior to not be killed. Or in the case of evolution, evolutionary uh, systems, they will optimize their behavior to, to reproduce. Those behaviors are not likely to be the ones that actually deliver a functioning business or a high quality ecosystem and if you think your business is not a an ecosystem you probably haven't looked around very carefully the end result is that you end up by following these incentives creating a directly bad outcome right and the example of the cobras is a great one what do we get we got more cobras because what we were actually incentivizing was cobras, right? Right. If you put a bounty on something terrible, like bugs in code, then as, as you mentioned last week, I'm going to go write me a minivan. You're not going to get yep. what you wanted. So yeah. I think in those scenarios, you want to be very clear about what the outcome you really want is. But also, you got to take into account those many steps that come between the incentive and the outcome you want. 
But when you, the scenario you talked about, drop it in the bottom five, it can't account for, let me, let me back that up. I heard about a sports and the sports scenario where they did their money ball analysis. I think it was with basketball though. And what they discovered was that when one guy was on the, the court, the whole team scored more. He was not a high scoring player, but somehow when he was on the court, they won more, they scored more. How do you deal with that with an incentive program like chopping the bottom 5%? You can almost. And the problem there is that you've got somebody who is, and these people exist in a lot of teams, right? They're the people who make the team function better. They act as kind of the social glue that holds that unit of people together and cohesive and keeps them pointing in a certain direction. And in many ways, the problem is that that person is almost guaranteed not to be the most productive person on the team in terms of raw outputs, right? Whether that be code or sinking basketball or whatever, because they're spending their time thinking about, hey, how's this guy over here doing? What's, how are they managing to do things? Oh, I see a problem over here. Oh, this person looks like they're upset by that. Let me go talk to them. And so they are helping others rather than benefiting themselves and the only way you could potentially reward that person is to do so based on the overall performance of the team yeah when when organizations say that they want people to act like leaders that's acting like a leader and then you fire that person for acting that way yeah and and the result is that what you get are people who aren't leaders that you get people who are entirely focused on how do I advance myself at the expense of the whole. And I, I've actually worked with managers like that. I remember one consulting firm I worked with years ago where the guy I worked for had that attitude. He wanted his various managers to actually compete against one another to succeed. The problem was, of course, we all had the same client. And so success was being measured on how good you were at persuading other people to give up their resources, even though it's all coming from the same bucket, it's for the same client, to do what you your to advance your project and it put the client's needs on the back burner. So let's talk about the annual budget process. Stay with me. On your general ledger, let's only consider, say, two major uh, ledger entries. You have uh, improvements and you have maintenance. And the the software that you use to run your entire organization has a new version. Now, if we're being realistic, it's had five new versions since you first installed it and you haven't installed any of the new versions because, oh my God, we can't do that every year. It costs too much to do. So now you're looking at a major jump in versions and you have to figure out whether you're going to charge that to maintenance or to new functionality. So Kevin has a former executive in an organization that was that lived and died by its software. Where did you charge that work? Well, to be fair, I, w I wasn't an executive at the organization where we built, built software, but I can say that it makes a big difference uh, financially because it affects the way the bottom line works. If I'm One option is that I'm charging this stuff against um, capital, right? And capital me if I charge it against capital, that means that I can amortize this over a period of time. And right? charging so against take, capital, this would be the maintenance side or the the, this is the net new. This is the kind of new. This is kind of the new thing, right? The new side. But the thing is that that becomes an investment. I can amortize over a number of years, and so it doesn't take as much of a hit on the bottom line as it does if I dump it into an operating expense where I have to take the entire payment all at once and recognize it all at once in this year. Back to my scenario. 
when you're installing an updated version of existing software, is it net new or is it maintenance? Those are your and only options, right? They are. And the, the reality is that companies make different decisions on that based on the way what their books look like at the time, right? It's one of the things where finance becomes a little bit more interesting than we give it credit for. I bring this up because that's not actually the only set of options that you have. You could charge part of it to maintenance and part of it to new functionality in some ratio like 60-40. Take the hit on some of it, amortize some of it by using two general ledger entries. Because the reality is the new version of Windows or of Office or Lotus Notes or whatever, it has new functionality and it's bug fixes and maintenance and support and sustainability. But if you constrain your thinking to only one or the other, you end up creating a perverse incentive where I have personally been required to write code to dismantle or shut off functionality that the business desperately needs because the only way we can pay for the new software is out of the maintenance budget. And if there's new functionality charged to a maintenance budget, the world comes to an end. Yeah. So now you're paying me money, good money, to cripple working code that goes against your business needs because it's impossible to conceive of charging part of a project to one GL and part of the project to another. Here's another good example. And this comes up a lot in companies that go through lean transformations. Inventory. You company, a lot of companies have inventory sitting around, right? Sure. Stacks of stuff that they need to sell in the future that's going to generate revenue at a certain point in time. If you move to a more just-in-time kind of operation, what's happening is that you're reducing the amount of inventory you hold. Fair enough. That's the, I mean, that's the point, right? Right. But here's the thing. That inventory is on the books as an asset. It increases the value of the company. And so oh. as you make the transition to more of that just-in-time thing, you can have a scenario where um, your assets are cratering, right? And you haven't recognized the revenue yet because the sale hasn't, been, hasn't met your criteria for coming in. Eventually, it should shake out. But you can have scenarios where in the short run, if people are monitoring stuff month by month, there's a real incentive to build up inventory in the pipeline that may never be sold because it increases the assets that are held by the company and thus the book value of your part of the organization interesting and i think definitely perverse yeah i only know a little bit about the finance side of things and so i find it endlessly fascinating when those kinds of uh of motivators pervert the courts of justice, you know, get in the way of of achieving the outcomes that they're supposed to support. If, you, if people are looking for this, and uh, we can put this in the show notes, there's a book called Financial Intelligence that is a reasonably easy read that gives you a high level introduction as to what what all of these different balance sheets mean and what their value is and how they trade off against one another. And yeah, one of the things that I've learned dealing with finance is that. There's a lot of baked in assumptions about how the business works that can create perverse incentives. Exactly. Is this kind of stuff covered in the like the commonly accepted accounting practices? Uh GAP. G A A P. We're generally accepted accounting practices. And they have guidelines, but those guidelines leave a lot of flexibility for recognizing stuff. Because, and the problem is that they have to because the situation really does vary from company to company. That's interesting. I think in this episode, we may not be solving perverse incentives. I think we may be exposing them more than anything else. 
I guess the question would be, again, from Man Zero perspective, is how do I recognize that I've built in perverse incentives into incentive program? And more importantly, what do I do about it if I know that I've trained my employees to screw the company over? Okay, the first thing I want us to do is not talk about incentive programs, although those are a real thing and we need to acknowledge them. I think we need to talk about the incentives themselves because most incentives in organizations are not part of a traditional incentive program where there's a bonus at the end, right? Most incentives are things like have a specific number of hours in your timesheet or um, have, you know, take a certain amount of vacation over a certain period of time. They're not the things that you set out as incentives. They're the parts of the system that drive behaviors. And when you think about them that way, it's a little bit easier to, to, if not disentangle, at least recognize the interrelationships that can drive some of the worst behaviors. Which is kind of why I dove into that whole idea of using two GLs instead of just one for a project. Because there's an incentive that Nobody even thinks to question, and now it's so deeply embedded in most accounting systems that even if you wanted to do the right thing, you would have to burn down your entire company and start over with software that doesn't exist to actually do it in any sort of a non kludgy way. The first part of what you said, of what you asked, is how do you recognize that you have a perverse incentive already? I would say it's very hard to, to catch it before it, it comes back to bite you. But the, I guess my first piece of advice would be that when you put the incentive program in place, you better be damn sure you're putting the measurement program associated with it through the ringer. Like it better be front and center every day, just or as often as it can be during the trial period that you explicitly note as being the trial period so everybody knows that it's not the final incentive program and that everybody expects that the incentive program will be changed before it is solidified based on their behavior and their feedback and you know the managerial uh, or business outcomes i mean unless you're trying to be more subtle than that and more manipulative than that. Well, and in fact, one one old friend of mine used to always argue that um, the way to set up these kind of programs correctly is on top of the metrics that you're using to manage individual performance, you also need a set of metrics that are showing you how the system is performing as a whole, and you watch those like a hawk and you step in to correct it when those metrics start to go out of whack, and you but and you don't incentivize people based on those system wide measures because you don't you don't want them gaming those measures. <laughs> I'm not now. How does that work in practice? I don't know, but it's but it's certainly an approach that seems to have some merit. So just running that through the old you know computer in between the ears. The first issue you have is it if you could believe that the organizational level of measurements could remain secret you can get away with that but you know they won't they won't stay secret people will find out so then you'll be relying on information that you believe your employees e.g. the enemy don't have when in fact they are operating with better knowledge about the real incentives. And so I think a, a more effective approach is likely to be presuming or even directly exposing the real incentives and then trying to build balancing incentives into the program gamifying the program so that the natural desire to to not play the game but to play with the game or to game the game 
that those natural drives that people have end up supporting the game. You know, we're both tabletop gamers and, and role-playing game folks since way back. I'll, I'll mention it, and then we may never speak of this again. But Or we may, or we may, who knows. But uh, the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons was explicitly designed with that intention. That mastery over the rules of the system was supposed to be an objective that the game drove. And, you know, here I am showing my King of the Nerds thing, but I'm sure you can take it back if you want to. But an online no, no, forum no, that was... I'm not taking that back from you. <laughs> well, actually, there there are those out there who would beat both of us in that contest. But Absolutely. Anyway, my point was that there was actually an online forum dedicated to building the most obnoxious possible characters. It ended up at the final analysis with, you know... Somebody figured out how to make a first-level character with godlike omnipotence. And if you really want to look it up, because you have that background in D&D, do a Google search on Pun Pun. That's P-U-N hyphen P-U-N, and you'll find much more than you ever needed to know. Now, of course, we've gone off on this little divergence because, you know, we were both steeped in that kind of lore. But your business is built on rules like this, and most of them haven't been written down. Or if they were written down, it was before your business was ever created. You know, they've they just become the background noise for how businesses operate and the background assumptions for how things should go. And when you're in that kind of a scenario where you don't even know you're making assumptions... It can be really, really hard to see when you're going to set yourself up not only to fail, but to actively work against your own objectives. Right, and that's where you can get into real trouble if you get somebody who's narcissistic or sociopathic into business and is the kind of person who can spot all of those unwritten rules and understand how to play the game effectively in your company and abuse the hell out of it for his or her own personal gain. I, I totally agree with you. And the, and the challenge that you face really is not... As a manager, you probably shouldn't spend a huge amount of your time trying to defend against that one crazy person. If you can recognize that they're crazy, there's probably enough conflicting rules and conflicting um, incentives out there that you can find a way to document their behavior to get them out or get them... Uh, or to incentivize them to behave in a way that you think is preferable to their their quote unquote natural behaviors. And honestly, that was the solution that Dungeons and Dragons ended up working with too. It was to recognize that it's probably impossible to prevent rules lawyering from abusing the systems and instead go back to okay, well let's design this for reasonable people and assume that, you know, in most groups of players, social pressure and social cohesion will do the job of keeping that in place. And I agree with you. Again, it's not you can't you can curb some of the worst abuses, but for the most part, the best way of dealing with crazy people is to screen them out in the hiring process. And if you just find that someone slipped through, get rid of them, move them out. I agree. Rather than trying to prevent create a structure that makes it impossible for them to abuse it because there isn't one and there isn't going to be one. Exactly. If you're trying to create a system that can account for every level of idiocy, the world will build a better idiot for you. You cannot spend your time doing that unless you're an actual lawyer, in which case you should probably flip all of our advice so you can bill more. <laughs> and, and I know that's funny but I'm also serious about it because as an executive or manager in an organization, when you go to your legal department, you probably want to remember that because your, your lawyers are strongly incentivized to build incentives into your contracts, which frequently work against the purpose of the contract. So I experienced this where... There was this huge motivation to treat vendors as the enemy. 
when the explicit purpose of the work that they were doing was to bring everyone closer together, to work like like partners, to really be partners. But they put themselves in this situation where all the contractual work was based on the assumption that they're going to screw us and we have to defend against that. And I don't know, Kevin, you're married. Is that a good way to go into a marriage? Uh, not. I don't think so. You know, ours may differ, but certainly that I don't see benefit in that. And, you know, and again, that comes from a basis of fear, right? It's trying to prevent, it's focusing on preventing the worst possible outcome rather than trying to get a good outcome. So I think that that, what you just said, is a good starting point for finding a potential perverse incentive before it becomes one. It's always fun talking to you. I learn stuff. Uh, some of that's even useful, I bet. Well... <laughs> you know, if we go back to our last episode of Incentives, we, talk, we talked about the financial ones, the legal ones, the rules ones, but I think there's also issues around incentives with intrinsic motivation. And this becomes, I think, a big deal for companies that are trying to undergo some degree of cultural change. Sure. Because the reality is most companies have attracted a certain kind of person that has a certain sort, sort of orientation. And let's say, for example, you're working at a company that has historically been all about product leadership. And you want to change it to, say, a company that's more about efficiency or more about you know customer intimacy but the thing is that you're working against a team of people who were incentivized to be there because they want they got the opportunity to work on the newest stuff so what are you going to do about that do you change your hiring practices i mean that's going to take years are you going to be able to turn those product leadership people into customer service people i know what you do you buy another company. Oh, no, wait, we found that fails, too. Mm hmm Okay, so two things. I don't know if there's an answer we can provide that um, will apply across very many cases, but I'm also not sure whether there's a perverse incentive in there. Like, are we talking about just the, the normal kind of failures that you can run into by incentivizing? Or are we talking about that more pernicious type of incentive that actively conflicts with your goals and sets you not only, like it doesn't only block you from them, but moves you further away? Well, I think in a lot of cases you kind of are, right? Because what I've seen happen in those kind of scenarios is that you blow up what you used to be good at. And you have nothing left to build on for what you now want to be good at. Okay. You know, but let's look at a company that has been going through that very painful process of changing around how they think about themselves, and that's Microsoft. You know, Microsoft has been undergoing a very, very difficult and prolonged transition from, you know, what was, I would say, a product-centric company to a services-centric one. There are lots of incentives that work at like tangents and distract or which are just barriers to overcome. When the incentive is perverse, it's actually driving you away from your goal. So swimming towards the shore makes you go further away from the shore until you drown. The worst kind of first incentives are the ones that are invisible to you or worse yet, appear to make perfect sense until you recognize that there's, they're preventing you from doing something that's really critical. And that's, I think, where Microsoft was with Windows. Windows was becoming, was driving the company to the extent that, you know, they delivered subpar versions of Office on other platforms. Mac, Office for Mac was pretty crappy for a long oh time. Oh my it, goodness, yes. You know, now that they've had, you know, they've keen to light and they've come to Jesus and all of that. Um, it's not, it's still, it's not at quite the same level, but the latest versions of Office are way, way better on Mac and on iOS and on Android than they used to be. 
Yeah, and they're they're really better than any competing product, as far as I can tell. You ask, what do we do about a perverse incentive if you're stuck in it or stuck with it? You don't have an option about, you know, changing the incentive itself. You're just stuck trying to deal with it because the incentive was set by the system that is your organization or by something totally external over which you have no control. Could be an executive, could be market forces, whatever. So what do you do? I like asking you that because you asked me that last time and I had to struggle. So now it's your yeah. turn. And I was going to say that, you know, the thing is that the Adela's uh, solution isn't one that I think most companies have the luxury of pursuing, or most managers have the luxury of pursuing, which is that you know you need a, you have a massive failure that you can evade, that you can not take personal responsibility for, because the Adela was against the sale, and so he could justify that, right? That demonstrates to everybody that the old incentives and the old ways of thinking about it are no longer viable. But most of the big examples I can think of are cases like that, you know, it's, it really comes to, seems to come down to you have to demonstrate that the old incentives and the old ways of working are failing. So when you le read about, like, the traditional descriptions and discussions of perverse incentives have led me to believe that they're almost impossible to root out until the disaster is already struck. And they're sticky, like they're very persistent. So even if everybody knows that the behaviors that are underway are going to result in disaster, nobody is able to stop them. This is Target Canada, right? Yeah. Everybody involved knew that they were heading for a fall. They actively worked to achieve failure and then succeeded at to achieving failure Dad, you know I wish there was a better way to phrase that but really that's what they did is there a way to short circuit that bring the failure right up front to stop it or like should you take a different approach where you try to get a scary failure in early to motivate people away from the the existential dread, you know, in the Cobra example, what kind, what would that be? Would that be a British officer sneaking around at night and smashing out all the Cobra cages in a couple of villages just to demonstrate to people why raising Cobras is a bad idea? I don't feel like that. Aside from you know, all the people dying from Cobra bites, nobody mentioned ethics. It is ethically horribly problematic, but let's assume that you're in a case where, you know, disaster really is looming and you have the opportunity to stop it if you can convince people that disaster is looming. And the thing is that, yeah, I think it is true that in most cases, uh, people are very reluctant and very resistant to recognizing potential disaster. Okay, I'm going to monologue as briefly as I can. When my doctor said, you have cancer and you need to undergo certain treatments, I said, well, you know, what are my options? Because they were listing off all these side effects and long-term effects. And, and I said, you know, how do I mitigate those? Because I know risk management and I know how to talk about this stuff. And finally, one of my doctors said, you don't. We just want to get you to be alive long enough for you to have to worry about it. And that was the right answer. Yeah. You know, that's that's that was the situation. And that's sometimes what you need to do. So the alternative to the actual failure is to generate an awareness of failure, is to get everybody focused on, okay, here's the this thing has to change and be fixed or we're gonna die. And and I I find that to be and maybe I'm a bit perverse in this sense. I find that delightful. Like, it really it brings joy to my heart to think about using the cognitive biases associated with loss aversion and, and our inability to understand risk and instead to focus on fear. Yeah, I find it delightful when people can do that 
to cause a very positive outcome or to reframe people's attitudes out of their local minima and into a broader view of the greater good. The challenge that you face, I think, as, as an ethical person is how do you do that and still go home and be able to kiss your, your wife with that mouth that told those tales? Do you have an answer? The best I can give is that, you know, it sucks and it's painful, but if it if you feel like you really are doing the right thing to preserve an organization that you care about, that a lot of people are invested in, you know, then it can be justified, but you'd always better be aware of the ethical consequences of what you're doing. You don't come out of experience like that, and I have been through experiences like that, feeling good about everything that happened. Even if you no. look back and say, I don't know what I could have done differently. And I do still ask myself in those kinds of situations, is there another course of action I could have taken that would create the right results? Especially when you know, you go through that and it doesn't work. I think our conclusion about perverse incentives is you may not have a lot of good options. You may be, you know, struggling to find the least worst option. And on that front, Julian, I think one way that, or one thing that helped me get through some of those experiences is... Going back to a Terry Pratchett quote I know you're very fond of, which is that the root of all evil is when you start to see people as things. Said Granny Weatherwax. You know, if you're faced with one of these difficult situations where you have to do something that's going to be painful to the pe people you are dealing with to salvage an organization, the one thing that you must try to do in order to avoid compromising yourself is to recognize that real people are being affected by what you're doing and not to turn it into, you know what, I'm going to blame you for the situation and depersonalize it so it's all on your head. And I'm going to, so I can walk out of here thinking that, you know, I'm the good guy, and I did the right thing down the line. Instead, it might be, you know what, I, ha I had to do this. It sucks a lot for the people who are negatively affected by it, but it would suck more for everybody if I didn't deal with the situation. So the Cobras, in our ideal world, would have said, wow, we really messed this up. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to tax Cobra, cobra Keeping. And then, of course, you have to deal with the ramifications and the ramifications. But at least if you are recognizing that the people who were acting in their own self-interest by farming cobras, they were doing it because I set up a scenario where that was their most viable option. Right. And so another alternative or something that could be combined with what you're suggesting is a you know, phasing out the bounty, maybe even in stages over a period of time, rather than just stopping it. So that, you know, all these people who have cobra farms are incentivized to kill the cobras and bring in the bodies, knowing that it's not going to be worth their while to keep the cobra farms going. Here's your incentive. Liquidate your cobra farm now. Although it may not deal with the initial problem of too many cobras, at least it would not accentuate the problem or, or make it even worse than it was in the first place. Yeah. Wow, we really didn't give any really great advice, hey? Some, some situations just suck. And on that note, good night. Good night. This has been the Change Fail Podcast with Kevin Brennan at BA Kevin and Julian Sammy at SCI underscore BA. You can also reach them on Twitter at CHGFAIL and Facebook.com slash ChangeFail. Watch, listen, and subscribe at their website, Change.Fail. Remember, no dot com on the end, just Change.Fail.